on an unprecedented, unparalleled scale. But not only that, I mean, the Pew Internet Report last week pointed out that we've got roughly 73% of teachers who are, who are at least experimenting or engaging in some sort of handheld device usage, including cell phones. So here we are in the near-term future, looking at the prospect of kids coming in with devices that allow for these immersive, active environments that have the kinesthetic properties that allow you to zoom in on that chromosome. You're walking around with, with a device that has a tremendous amount of creative potential, goes well beyond just consumption or even curation potential. But here's the rub. <coughs> In our travels with various schools and probably thousands of educators that we've worked with in iPad integration, we are missing an opportunity with huge repercussions. And let me explain. So here we have a handheld device that is essential, essentially a portable creation device. I mean, you have a language lab in your hands. You can be creating virtual tours, digital stories, screencasts. Your students can be demonstrating their knowledge in literally thousands of creative and innovative ways. And yet, what's happening? I wrote a piece, five critical mistakes schools are making with iPads. And the first, most prevalent, and by far the most injurious to this point, is this overemphasis on content apps. So many educators see the iPad as a, re as a repository of apps. So I'm thinking about uh, last summer, we have a three-day iPad workshop at Harvard University, talking to a social science teacher, and we're going, I used to think, now I think. In other words, what did you think before you came in the workshop? What do you think after the workshop? So she says, you know, I thought the iPad was crap, her words. I said, why? Since I couldn't find a good Manifest Destiny app and an Oregon Trail app. <laughs> you laugh, but this is what I run into everywhere. I, I read the, another social study teacher. I spent seven hours researching Constitution apps. The physics teacher, oh yeah, um, I, I've got a long, long list of 200 potential you know, math and science apps. I go and they're instructional technology specialists who hand out lists like 75 reading apps or vocabulary apps. Stop. <laughs> All the apps that you need fit on one screen. In our three-day iPad integration workshop across grades, across, um, across uh, different disciplines, we use a handful of apps and not one subject-specific app. With an app like Book Creator, you can create all sorts of multimedia books, magazines, reports. With a screencasting app like Explain Everything, you can create all sorts of demonstrations of understanding, of knowledge, of mastery of a topic, of, of tutorials, of virtual tours. With a video editing app such as iMovie or an audio editing app such as GarageBand, again, you have an extraordinary amount of creative learning opportunities for students. But just like that Latin teacher who said to me that the iPad was useless because he couldn't find a good Latin app, what I find is educators are oblivious to the full spectrum of active and immersing learning potential with the iPad. Hey, we have an opportunity. We actually have a device that is, is kinesthetic. We have a device that's immersive. 
We have a device that plays to active learning. We have a device that's so flexible that in a moment I can change my instructional strategy. We have a device that's mobile so we can go outside, we can go anywhere and shoot. Uh, we have all of, the, all of this potential and it's all like, um, can you find me American Revolution app? That needs to stop. We are so susceptible in our field to, oh, it's all about bells and whistles. It's, it's about lack of visible thinking. It's about the shallows. So here we are in an epic with a device that's unparalleled in its adoption in schools. Do you know that Los Angeles has just approved $50 million for tablet integration? And at San Diego and other large school districts have dished out similar amounts. I mean, this is unprecedented. And are we going to then take this device and use it in immersive, active learning environments that develop essential skills such as creativity? Or are we going to turn it into a, a, just a repository of apps and tell kids take notes? So that's the challenge and the opportunity in my mind that now awaits us with iPad integration. So we eschew these, oh, here are 50 apps for history or 50 apps for science. You know that we, we, we organize our iPad as page at edtechteacher.org? It's all about learning. I want my students to do this. I want my students to do this. It's all about performance-based activities. We don't put the, the proverbial cart before the horse. We identify what the learning objectives are, the learning activities, and then you choose an app based on what the learning objective is. That's how you select an app. You don't go, okay, this is an app, I really like it, it's really cool, I think my kids will like it, so I'll use it. Well, what's the academic purpose? That is purposeless. Engagement is fine. Yeah, I want kids to be engaged. I want kids to be excited about learning, but we are not amusement park directors. Our ultimate goal is teaching and learning, and we have to clearly identify the teaching and learning objectives for the use of any tool, an app or whatever. So that's where we start. What is it that you want students to be able to do? And then you search the apps or the tools that will help you accomplish that goal. So we have this creativity device, this portable media creation device. It's amazing what you can do. A couple of years ago, I was going around to schools and I was saying, nah, not, not iPads. And they go, why not? Because it, it's, it, it's a consumption device. It's just a consumption. I want a device that enables student-centric active learning, and it doesn't. But it's amazing the growth and flexibility and power of apps in just two years. It's amazing what's happening now with Google Drive. In such a short period of time, nobody was talking about Google Drive app a year ago, and now we're all talking about it as for active collaboration and how it's being updated frequently. It's getting more and more and more as robust as the web. We weren't talking to a couple of years about, about really shooting and editing with the iMovie app. It was still limited and a little bit clunky. Now we are. So now we're at that point. We're at that point where we can seriously look at this as a, as a creativity device. So now we've got to be thinking about what are the types of creative learning opportunities that we can put students in. What can we do with the iPads? The hard part is not learning explain everything. We take teachers, we don't, even, we don't even show them the app. You know what we do? We say, you've got 25 minutes to go in a small group, take pictures of the building, and come back with a screencast. Like, we don't even show them how to, how to do anything. They come back in 25 minutes, done. Like, we don't even have to teach them. So these apps are becoming so intuitive that the challenge is not learning the apps and learning the tool. The challenge is really what to do with them. And here's where we're at a disadvantage as opposed to Web 2.0. Hey, Web 2.0, VoiceThread. Go to VoiceThread. They've got a library. You can see all sorts of examples, right? But what about examples on iPads? Where are they? On the iPads. They're locked on the iPads. So we have this dearth of exemplars and models. Plus, we're in its infancy with a lot of schools are just starting with a program or maybe one year. What might it look like? So here's one example of what it could look like. And this is based out of a first grade class. Get set, ready now, jump right in, bounce and kick and giggle and spin. 
Listen to the rope when it hits the ground. Listen to the rope go slappity sound. Jump right up when it tells you to. Come back down, whatever you do. <laughs> count to 100, count by 10. Start to count all over again. And you did some movement lines? Yeah. Going up? I did going twirling around and up, going up. And so you use some of those nonfiction features like the arrow up. And tell me what this one is. Twirling around. And then what's this part with the numbers? Something you change the Count background. Count to 100 by 10. Counting by, because you heard that line where it said, count to 100, count by 10. Start to count all over again. If you could define one skill that this teacher is trying to nurture, what is it? Their creativity. I mean, we, we've all been there, right? We've all sat and we've listened to story time. I have good memories of sitting there trying to fix some stories. I'm not advocating that students should always be creating some product while they're listening. There's much to be said by sitting in silence and listening to this. But there now are opportunities where we can immediately put kids in immersive creative learning environments where they can demonstrate their thinking, demonstrate their knowledge, their visualization, in this case, using the iPad. So what, what opportunities exist in your classroom? What opportunities exist in, in your school, your district? And this is where our focus should be. The focus should not be spending seven hours on uh, researching Constitution apps. There is not an app for leadership. There is not an app for good teaching. And this is what we, we should be having conversations about. We should be having conversations about pedagogy. We should be, ha be having conversations about creating these immersive learning environments for kids. <laughs> Once we start to create these immersive learning environments, the physical spaces change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how physical spaces may change with virtual spaces. So um, here I'm in Singapore. It may be difficult to see. I'm at what's called a future school in uh, Jurong, Singapore. There's about six future schools in Singapore. I was very lucky to be invited to visit the school and, and, and others. Um, the desk, do you notice it's vertical? The desk is vertical, it's on wheels, so that you can push the desk off to the side, anywhere in the room, so that the kids can move around and the kids can congregate and interact. Um, also, notice it's fat on one end or large on one end and thin on the other, a little bit like a pizza. So when you push four of them together, you get a circle, so that again, kids can interact. Kids can, so, so do you look at the picture, is there a single vestige of technology? But this is a technology-infused school with a whole uh, uh, video studio. They have all sorts of devices. They have desktops. They have uh, handheld devices. I don't see a single piece of hardware, software, no mobile device. But I know exactly the learning mission of the school, and I can identify it in one word. Tell me what it is. Right, collaborate. That's the learning objective. It is clear. I walk into any classroom, and what you see, you see kids engaged in group, creative, dynamic environments. So the school has a very clear, concise learning mission, and they design everything, not just the way the technology is used, but they actually physically redesign the classroom to nurture the learning objective. I'll show you next what the study hall looks like. There it is. So you have kids who have a flat screen at one end, so one of the kids can plug in, I mean plug in the laptop or whatnot, and they're sitting face to face. So what do you think they're doing? They're talking. Again, they're collaborating, they're talking, they're sharing. It's a group. It's a group activity. This is from Vancouver, Kakitlam, which is about 30, mi 30 minutes, I guess, west of Vancouver. Dave Truss, as some of you know, uh, probably through Twitter, is a principal of the school. This is a public school. Only about maybe, I think, 35, 40 kids right now. 
And what you're looking at is their um, ideal wall. So here's, here's how it works. You've got mostly high school kids. And uh, they have traditional classes in the morning, right? So they do ELA, they do history, science, whatever it is in the morning. In the afternoon, they might be engaged on their ideal wall. So the purpose of this school, called the Inquiry Hub, is to identify students' interests and then empower them to take ownership of pursuing a relevant, essential question. So they're paired up with a mentor, and the mentor helps them research, explore a topic that interests them, and then develop a meaningful, relevant, essential question. They pursue that interest for a matter of weeks, and then they will present what they know, understand, have mastered in the topics in different modalities. So some of them uh, may do a, a traditional stand-up and deliver like this. Some of them may do a movie, a podcast, even an essay. They have a wide latitude. So they, the, the Inquiry Hub shifts a lot of responsibility for learning onto the shoulders of the students. And it's trying to nurture their passion, knowing that out of passion comes creativity, and out of creativity comes innovation, uh, strategies, answers, approaches to problems. So I was there, and one of the kids into music played bass guitar, and was interested in grunge music, and wanted to study kind of the evolution of rock and roll, and try to, try to make some connection between music and societal impact. So he was studying music, but he was also studying um, history. He studied a little bit of art. And at the end of it, though I didn't see it, gave his culminating presentation. What's also striking about this school, it's blended. So they're redefining the physical space. They're going, you know, the kids don't need to be at school every day. So at least half of the instruction is online. So they follow a combination of asynchronous modules and live webinars. And the asynchronous modules have core content, and they have a group, and I, I met them, about six online mentors that help the kids so that they have one-to-one -one feedback, and they're in discussion forums for group feedback as well. So they're rethinking and understanding that uh, learning is not defined by four walls. It can happen anywhere, anytime. And more and more, education is less about a place and more about a space. And this is what they're doing. Well, how about here in, in uh, the U.S.? This is uh, Don Orr School, Hillbrook, which is in Northern California. And they have an iPad, uh, an iPad program. And they're, they're, what they're trying to do is to change the physical space so to sort of nurture the type of essential skills and immersive environments that I'm outlining. And so I've got a little clip. We'll show you how they can re reconfigure, redesign the classroom to, to helpfully promote these creative synergies. So here we go. <laughs> Justin Reich, who um, has a doc doctorate from Harvard in the School of Education, he blogs for Ed Week. He talks about what a, an effective technology integration activity looks like. He has a term for it. He calls it a creative design agency. And it looks a little bit like that. Think about, I don't know, young kids, mad, you know, madmen. Um, they're all kind of like rushing around going, do you have this, design this, let's brainstorm. They have all sorts of different individuals or different kids on different tasks. It might be a production task, a design task. And they're all responsible to each other because ultimately they have to do the presentation to the client. And all of the elements need to play, need to be in place. They've got to be talking to the finance people. They've got to be talking to the marketing people. They've got to be talking to the design people. They've got to be talking to the ad agent. 
And this, this in many ways is what's happening. And all these reconfigurations of have kids interacting with kids in all of these different, um, different environments, but collectively they're creating a product. So what could you do by thinking about redefining your space that you can help promote this type of interaction and maybe create your own creative design agency? So next, what I'd like to do is broach a topic here. I think it's a lot of people's minds, BYOD. The uh, ever pugnacious uh, Gary Steger wrote an article recently. He called BYOD, or Bring Your Own Device to School, um, the worst education idea of the 21st century. And the reason he called it that is essentially over the issue of equity, issue of inequality. In Steger's mind, if we have a BYOD a realm or BYD environment, it plays to the lowest common denominator. In other words, the kids, kid with the weakest device is going to be the focus of any activity. Because if it doesn't play on that weakest device, it doesn't play for everyone in the classroom. So the argument being is if you're limiting your instructional activities, your, your practices to the lowest common denominator or the weakest device, and you're perhaps humiliating the kid who doesn't have the cell phone or doesn't have the latest iPad, if you're putting that in that, in that socio-dynamic, you're doing more harm than good. However, the very astute, albeit somewhat cynical, uh, Audrey Waters counters that. Think about the potential and the possibilities if students were to bring their own devices. Now you're opened up to a whole range of instructional practices, lessons, and activities that you couldn't have imagined if they did not have the devices. So as Audrey points out, yes, there will be issues of inequality. There will be issues of inequity. At the same time, having those devices affords a plethora of new, innovative lessons, activities, strategies that were impossible before these devices arrived. And you have a great deal of personalization and customization that's now available if kids have their own device. And because it's their own device, they know that device better than the device perhaps you give them at school. And unlike the shared card iPad, uh, the uh, shared card MacBooks where the kids take off all the keys, <laughs> they, they own that device. They own that device. What we find, and if you think about it, it's pretty basic. If you're going to decide between a shared environment for any mobile or, or any computing environment and a one-to-one, -one, always go one-to-one. -one. Imagine I took your iPad away from you now. I said, yeah, you can only have it one hour a day. How vested are you in that iPad? If you're telling kids, okay, you know, right, we're going to have a pilot program, kids, we're giving you the iPads, but hey, kids, it's not yours, and hey kids, you can't, you, know, you can't really save anything on that iPad because it's going to be shared. How vested are they? What we know, and Justin's found out in sort of looking at research, is one-to-one -one models, despite of course the extensive financial considerations here of going one-to-one, -one, are more successful than shared models. And for those with, that have those financial constraints, they go one-to-one -one at a particular class or grade level and then emanate up or go down, have more success than those who have a ubiquitous shared cart model. So we've got some issues of equity that we have to think about, some issues of inequality, and I wonder if she's right. Is that where we're headed? I mean, right now, EdTech Teacher is riding an iPad wave. Uh, we could be nothing but iPad integration company at, at this point in time. 
Uh, we didn't intend that to happen. Yes, we marketed, we have a business plan, but we, do, we, we don't want to be the iPad people. We want to be the teaching and learning people. And um, we will help schools because we feel there's a critical need now to use iPads effectively because if we don't, we've missed a tremendous opportunity and we are so susceptible to valid criticism that it's all about the bells and whistles and not about physical visible thinking and teaching and learning. But I know that this wave is going to stop or crash at some point. I know that something else is coming down the road, and the question is, what is it? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but it makes sense that B BYOD brings all sorts of affordances. One thing that we know um, over the last 20 years is not all kids learn the same way. We've made... In We've made tremendous strides in trying to vary our instructional practices, to differentiate our resources, including computing resources, to meet the needs of diverse learners. BYOD helps us in that regard. It helps us in that regard. And in fact, those devices are excellent for UDL, for Universal Design for Learning, and trying to, re to reach each different learner where they are. So there's no question that technology brings with it uh, opportunities for a high degree of personalization, a high degree of customization that was impossible beforehand. And BYOD, to me, is a step in that direction. But we all know from a technical standpoint, it's challenging, and from an instructional standpoint, it's challenging. I don't know about you, but the conversations that I've had with schools who have gone BYD, talking to directors of technology, instructional technology specialists, what has struck me, it hasn't been the drain or as burdensome on the IT department as perhaps imagined. That may be because the kids know the device, so they're not always running down the hallway saying, how do you do this, how do you fix this? That's, that may be part of it. But what I do know, it's a huge challenge for the teachers. It's a huge challenge for the teachers to try to design activities that will be employed effectively on these varying devices and assure that level of equity and fairness in the construction of instructional practices. That, I think, is what our challenge is. I think going forward, um, we will learn more from each other on best practices from an IT standpoint, better understand infrastructure. And there are vendors that can help us with that. But I see the real challenge going forward is how do we teach in an equitable way that meets diverse learning aptitudes, and how do we engage them in, in, in creative opportunity. So related to this is the whole issue of literacy. It's redefinition and the implications from both a business and educational standpoint. Um, how many of you non-directors of technology, instructional technology specialists, that may cut the group down a little bit, but how many of you, if you're a classroom teacher, have heard of Inkling? I see, okay, so I see one hand. How many of you have heard, I don't know, uh, Socrative? Right, okay. If Socrative could raise one one hundredth of the money that Inkling could raise, it'd be rich. So let me explain. So Inkling, what is, what is Inkling? Inkling is actually a digital textbook. I'm going to change goggles here and... Uh, I will give you an example in a minute. So Inkling produces multimedia, immersive, interactive textbooks. It received about $17 million in VC funding from, guess who? The textbook publishers. Um, with McGraw-Hill being the principal investor. All right, so hopefully this is going to flash up there, and then you'll see what I see, and we'll be rolling. Yes, terrific. All right, wonderful. Okay, so we're looking at a sample chapter here. Uh, this is upper level high school or college. It's um, something on genetics. And this chapter you can download for free. 
at Inkling.com. You go to Inkling.com, you sign up, put an app on your iPad, or, um, and, and then you can download a free chapter. The book is expensive, but you can look at one of these samples. So I'll go down, and one of the things that you'll see is these little blue dots that if I tap on them, all right, so I have some definitions. So throughout this particular textbook, uh, I have definitions. As I go down, I could click on a picture, such as figure 9.1. Now, at first glance, all right, you've got some definitions. That's nothing exciting. Hey, a print textbook, you've got definitions on the side, right? And hey, static images, that's not exciting. But what's interesting here, it's actually a series of cascading images. So you're looking at the organism, whatever it is, flower, mushroom, I'm not sure, and then I tap on it, and I'm going down a level, we're starting to look at the structure of it. I don't know much about science, but I'm assuming we're getting into the DNA of this, of this plant. And now we're going down into terms I can't pronounce, and we go down even further. So you have a series of cascading images. You can visualize this from a history or geography perspective. Click on an image of the United States, click on Washington, D.C., click on the White House, and then maybe you can zoom over the White House. So there's lots of potential for using cascading images for a more immersive and deeper understanding of elements and objects than simply looking at a static picture in a printed textbook. So that in itself is, is, is quite interesting. But as I go down, what I see, and it's uh, very, very light for you, there's actually some yellow. There are some comments here on the page, though it's very, very, uh, very, very light for you, but I just tapped on something. So I've tapped on a comment. So as you might imagine, kids take notes in books, right? I mean, they have notes, comments, and whatnot. But this is really interesting. This is not micro, you know, microbial is. This is what is microbial. Why would a person in their own textbook write a question? Because it's not their own textbook. Whose textbook is it? Everybody's. Get it? It's like Google Docs. The textbook's live. The textbook is just like a Google Doc. It is live. So what's happening, I type what is microbial, and my friend Julie, who's on the textbook, sees my note. It notes up and says, well, Tom, microbial is this. It comes up, oh, thanks, Julie. Or the teacher says, hey, tonight, um, Fred, I'll meet you on page 292 on the textbook. I'll meet you on the textbook. And you have synchronous or asynchronous conversations within the book. So it's a social network. Your learning is a social network. So that's one of the fascinating incorporations into this higher-end, immersive, multimedia, interactive digital textbooks. The fact that you can create your own learning social environment within the textbook. All of these notes are then collected into a notebook. So you have everybody's notes for the whole year. Um, there are other elements here which, are, which perhaps are less revolutionary but are still interactive, though a limited uh, extent. Uh, another example is quiz. So these textbooks have quizzes. These are basic, factual, true, false, or multiple choice. And some of them are simply test yourself, and some of them you're graded. So you can have the student open up the textbook, the student can be in conversation with you on the textbook, conversation with other students on the textbook, and then the student could be taking one of your tests or simply testing themselves. So in this case, I have to study these organisms. I tap on test yourself, and now I see all these question marks. Does anybody know what this is? Mitochondria. Mitochondria? I'm not sure. Not sure? For a blast, I would have no idea. Um, so there you go. And I click on show labels, and now show labels. Very simple, and yet it is interactive, and I can use it as a practice device. What else does this have? Let's go to perhaps one of the more intriguing parts of the potential of digital textbooks. Now, when I studied science, and um, I, you know, I had a textbook many, many years ago, and DNA, and I would study pictures. I never had this opportunity. I never had a 3D immersive environment when I could kinesthetically explore the chromosomes with my fingers. 
So now what I can do to better understand the chromosome, I can zoom in on them. I can rotate them or zoom out on them. Do a 360 around them. So there are these 3D elements that you can explore kinesthetically that can give you a heightened, augmented understanding, a deeper understanding of that element. Imagine you're studying the human heart, aorta, blood, and then you could actually manipulate and see where the blood goes through the aorta, see where it's pumped out. Again, I don't know much about science, but I see all of these immersive three-dimensional kinesthetic activities that could give me a heightened understanding of these processes uh, through, through this. Uh, what else? There are perhaps a half dozen videos. Uh, I may not uh, wait until it completely loads, but now some of the processes, the scientific processes that were defined in the uh, video are now being demonstrated through the videos that are part of, part of the textbook. Um, so, quick straw vote here. How many of you is like, yeah, I want to explore that further? How many of you are like, no? All right, so most of you want to explore it further. Okay, so let me, let me go to the business side a little bit, kind of understand what's, what's going on now. So, Inkling invested heavily by McGraw-Hill. So, the big three, McGraw, Pearson, Harcourt, um, they have partnered in with Apple to provide tech books. I mean, Apple textbooks at a relatively low price. How many of you have invested in any Apple books at this point? All right, I mean, relatively co uh, low, co low cost as compared to a print textbook. The thing is, you can't just pass the digital textbook on to the next student next year, so you've got to re-up. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I trouble here. Yeah, yeah, you can have the book on the app. So, for example, in the Ink, Inkling, I've got the book on the app. Now, the way iPad is doing it, they're doing it through iTunes, and they want you to go through iTextbooks, and they want you to be on iOS 6 devices. What I'm trying to get, get at here is that you have some very powerful interests that are vested in you making that transition from the print textbook to their digital textbooks. In other words, you've got some you know, deep pockets, vested interests. The textbook publishers are investing a ton of money to help ensure that when McGraw-Hill stops printing textbooks, and one of the spokesmen said in three years. So if you're not planning, there's, there's your window. <laughs> you've got three years. So in, in that three-year block, when it's over, they are trying to lay down a groundwork so that you're going to make that transition to the digital textbook. One of the ways they're doing it is through these immersive features. You might say it's just bells and whistles, test yourself, or kinesthetic. I would argue that the kinesthetic value, the three-dimensional, has merit. I would say the videos have merit. But you know, a more cynical person would say they're trying to load it with bells and whistles so that you'll stay with them. How many of you are concerned about the uh, educational publishers having control over educational content? That's a lot of hands. All right, how many of you, perhaps non-directors of technology, um, know OER resources? You've gone to the website. Again, like two hands. So there's the idealist in me that wants to shout to you, take control over the learning. Take control over the learning. Who knows best the physics textbook for your students? Is it some textbook publisher or is it your physics department? Empower the physics department to create the textbook. Or if not the textbook, at least a reader. Or if not the reader, at least one supplemental unit. Empower them to do it. So I don't like the idea that the textbook publishers are aligned, and in this case aligned with Apple, to ensure we're all ensnared in content that you cannot manipulate you cannot manipulate. You can't cut and paste content out of it. You can't drag and drop. You can't say, oh, let me not use, like, like not have this chapter as part of my book. Or let me take out this page. Let me bring in, drag, drag and drop a video. You can't do that. You can't manipulate the content at all. So ideally, we would start to take some ownership over the production of these resources. 
The idealist in me says, yeah, let's do it. The pragmatist in me says, it ain't going to happen. How many of you are willing to take the days, weeks, months it might take to research, design, and then create a digital textbook? How many of you know where to start, even the resources that you should be looking at? So OER, just a couple of hands went up. Please go there. Go to, go to OER comments. You will find complete courses, and not just college, university. Teach, AP, whatever, physics there. I mean, they've got entire courses that are open resource and that you could use any of the materials. And that's just one example. Whether you teach Spanish, whether you teach uh, civics, whatever you teach, go there, look at those materials. They are free. So one step in taking ownership over these materials is knowing what open educational resources exist. And you all know that those open educational resources are coming fast and furious, aren't they? What's a MOOC? M-O-O-C. That's right, Massive Open Online Courses. So we, you know, we know about TEDx. We know about the flip lesson. We know about edX. There are all sorts of repositories of not only entire high school, middle school courses in science, in history, in other subjects. There's not only that, but there also exists a tremendous amount of multimedia material that's uh, now available. That's now available to you. And these materials, such as Flipped lessons using TEDx, where teachers can now add notes to videos to create flip lesson activities. Or edX, the list of edX contributors to MOOCs um, is growing, and the range of courses is, is expanding. Yes, it's mostly college, university. Yes, a lot of it is geared in, into computer science and related domains. Yes, there are a lot of adults but there are a lot of implications for us to be thinking about as well. And here's one of the implications. Is someone going to hack your school? And I'll explain what I mean by that. So this guy, this is Drew Stevens, was interviewed on NPR this morning. Anybody hear it in the way in? Yeah. All right, so he just wrote this book. I would heard about it last week called Hacking Your Education. So the, the fundamental premise here is that uh, college and university is extremely expensive. And when you come out of college and university, you don't necessarily have the skills you need to be successful in today's globalized uh, labor force. And so there's a disconnect between the money and the time that's invested in a college education and what you get out of it. So what Drew is arguing here is that we should start hacking our education. He dropped out of school after one year, and he argues that with with some guidance as to the right resources and strategies, you can customize and personalize your own education so that at the end of this pursuit, you leave with the skills and aptitudes you need to be successful in the workforce today. One of the motivating factors is the cost of education and the average $27,000 debt that a 23-year-old comes out with. But I'd say there are implications for K-12. Yes, K-12 is publicly funded. Yes, we don't have the same type of monetarily, uh, you know, sort of monetary motivation. But think now of the implications of a move towards personalized and customized learning. Like I said earlier, over the last 20 years, we've come to understand that we can't teach each student the same way. We've made extraordinary efforts through uh, uh, frameworks such as UDL and others to try to reach learners where they are, to try to diversify the strategies, uh, the resources, our practices, so that we can teach everybody. Well, that requires a, a, a large degree of customization and personalization. Hack Your Education is a huge step, a huge philosophical step forward into taking ownership over the education. Now, with your kids having iPads, or your kids BYOD, where they have cell phones, 
where they have the world's information at their fingertips, where they could take a course anywhere in the world, where they could get AP tutoring online from somebody outside of your school, where they could be going anywhere for instruction and mentoring anywhere in the world, how soon then do students and parents come to you and start hacking your school? So how do I get for Bobby that course, that instruction, that mentorship that I can't get here in your physical building? So I wonder to what extent the increased personalization and all the differentiation that we have here with, with technology, to what extent is that going to coalesce and we're start going to have schools and parents hacking our schools? Okay, you don't offer this course. I want Bobby to take this course. Ah, you don't have you know, a really proficient violin teacher, so I'm going to go outside of the school and I'm going to virtually use Skype and you know, my kids going to learn vi violin that way. Is that, is that a possibility going forward? So in closing, when I, I see we're at the advent of the future of mobile computing. The Horizon Report and, and others, which identifies both near-term, medium-term, and long-term trends in education and education technology, have pointed to this movement. Well, it's here. It's absolutely, absolutely here. Think about all the hands went up about iPads. Think of the growth and even the, you know, the growth of even cell phone usage, the consideration of allowing cell phones in schools. And that's a monumental paradigm shift if educators are thinking that they'll allow cell phones in schools. So we're here. Here's our opportunity. Let's not waste it. Let's not waste it. Let's not focus on those content apps. Let's not focus on the resources and, 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 and content that can take us away from the true, immersive, act, active learning potential and flexibility and personalization and customization. Let's be talking about teaching and learning. Let's not be talking about content apps. Thanks very much. Thank you.